Hi, everyone. So today we are talking about the time constant. Um, the time constant is um, it, it's a it's a variable used in physics and uh, engineering to indicate um, the rate at which something is going to decay. Uh, it's it's a really common uh, thing in physics and engineering that we use in decay functions. Uh, but let me give you a rundown before we start this. So um, we're going to talk about this function over here, right? We have um, a sphere traveling through a viscous fluid. Okay, this is type one viscous fluids. R equals BV is the equation uh, that we would talk about, right? So a sphere is approaching its maximum or terminal velocity as an asymptote, right? As it, as it should. As it approaches, it's going to start leveling off. If we graph a v versus t function, the time constant tau, as you can see on the bottom, is the time at which the sphere reaches a speed of 0 0.632 vt, or 63.2 percent of its terminal velocity. Now, the reason we do that, right? There are two uh, ways to calculate the terminal velocity, or not terminal velocity, the tau of a decaying function. Okay, so the one we're going to use is if you have an asymptote. That means that the object is, or the function, I'm sorry, is increasing up to a point and then it levels off. Uh, tau is the time it takes to reach 63.2% of that fine value. And that 63.2% comes from the idea that in the function of that graph, you will find 1 minus e to the negative 1. Um, and e to the 1, e, sorry, 1 minus e to the negative 1 equals 0 0.632. So that's where that comes from. Now, the other way to use tau is if you're function approaches zero, right? In a decaying function, this is common in radioactive decay. In that case, tau is the time it takes to reach, instead of 63.2, that is actually 36.8% because in those functions, you would just find one over E, which equals 0.368. So, uh, and in our equation, we will find this guy hidden in the function that we're about to solve for in number one, when it asks what equation describes this graph. So that is why we're worried about 63.2% of the terminal velocity. Um, that, that can be kind of confusing. A lot of students have kind of wondered, okay, so why do we care about 63.2? That's such a weird number. Because this given, uh, one minus e to the negative one, or one minus one over e equals 0 0.632. And, and I will prove that later, um, but uh, I just wanted to preface this before we go on, that that's why we're dealing with 0.632 vt. So what equation is, describes this graph? Well, it's a velocity versus time equation. Uh, it's obviously not r equals bv, that would be linear. Uh, it's ob also obviously not type two, because that would be r equals one half rho v squared dA, and if we're just dealing with v, the v is squared, and that would yield a parabola. So this is clearly something very different. So we're going to do a 15-step derivation, not 14, I'm sorry. This is really a 15-step derivation to reach the final conclusion on this problem. So I'm going to number our steps as we go. Hopefully you guys can follow along. So let's get started. We are going to start with number one. We're going to start with the assumption that summation of forces F equals MA, and those forces would be MG minus BV if we have the object going down MG resisted by R equals BV, right? So that's what we're starting with now. We want to get everything in terms of velocity. We don't want acceleration. So 
we are going to say that M, we're going to say that A is really dV dt, which equals mg minus bV. Right? Um, just take the derivative of acceleration, you get velocity there. Now what we're going to do is we're going to um, divide that B out of the way because we want to isolate our velocity on the right side. This may look kind of messy, but trust me, it's going to work. M divided by B times dV over dt. But then we have mg divided by B minus V. So that mg minus B looks kind of complicated, right? But for step four, if we look over here, if we have mg minus BV, and that is terminal velocity, that means that the acceleration is zero, right? So we can actually solve, add that over, we have mg equals BVT, and then we can say that terminal velocity actually equals mg divided by B um, if we are traveling at terminal velocity, right? If there's no acceleration. So if we come over here, we have that mg divided by b right there. So that is our next step. We will take m divided by b times dv dt, and that will equal vt minus b with this underlying assumption over here. Okay, now uh, this is really just a setup step for what's to come. So we're going to multiply by negative one. We have negative m over b times dv dt because we want this other side in this order. It's, it's going to help us later on. So that's really just a setup problem. Multiply both sides by negative one. Step six of uh, what we do is we're going to multiply, we're going to switch this around really. We're going to multiply that dt to the other side. We're also going to divide V minus VT to the other side, and then we're going to multiply, sorry, we're going to divide negative M over B. So it's going to turn out like this. We'll have DV over V minus VT equals negative B over M times DT. So that, there's a lot of algebra all in one step. Um, but what we just kind of moved some things around to get them in this order because what we're going to do is we're going to integrate next. Now, if you aren't familiar with integrals, this step might be kind of crazy, but don't worry. Um, once you get further on in your courses, you'll learn integrals and the, the integral we're about to do isn't nearly as complicated as it looks. But we will take number seven. We will take the integral from zero to velocity, some value V, of one over V minus VT dV. So what that means is we're taking the integral with respect to V, that's what dV means, and we're taking that integral of one over V minus VT. Then on the right side, we will take the integral of zero to time, because we have a dT on that side, of negative V minus N dT. Now, um, what we're going to do here is we're going to um, evaluate those integrals. So on part eight, when you uh, evaluate an integral, um, there are sometimes some tricks. So the integral of one over x with respect to x is actually the natural log of x um, because Nat, well, go, you know, ask your calculus teacher. That, that's, that's not the entire point here, but um, that is a um, integral identity is one way you could say it. That's an integral identity, kind of like a trig identity. It's just a general rule of integration. So uh, using that, we will say that this is the natural log of V minus VT from the value zero to some arbitrary v. And you can see that over here, we have zero and v. Uh, an integral is kind of like taking the area under a curve. So, uh, but to take the area under the curve, you want to set certain bounds to know how far you're taking the area. So here we're taking the area from zero to v. So we need to evaluate the natural log from zero to v. 
Now on the right side, uh, there is no T to take an integral with. Now, an integral can also be described as an antiderivative. And uh, when you take the derivative, say we take the derivative of a function that has no x in it, right? Well, if you just have a bunch of constants with no x's, I'll just give you an example. d over dx, let's say we have 3 plus 2y. Well, the derivative of 3 would be 0 because it's just a constant. And the derivative of 2y, we're taking the derivative with respect to x. So again, 2y is just a constant. So that becomes 0, right? But that's not the case with an integral because it's backwards. Kind of, It's an antiderivative. So if there is no variable, you give it one. So this would be negative b over m times t from some 0 to t value. OK, now let's uh, let's start simplifying these as we go. So first, we're going to evaluate them from 0 to v. And to do so, it's very common in, in physics. You do final minus initial. Right? So you take the natural log of, we're going to plug in v for v. Then you subtract the natural log of 0 for v. And that's your final minus or initial. Same on the other side, we will take negative b over m times t, then we will subtract negative b over m times zero. Um, now, obviously, everything multiplied by zero is going to go away in that one, but not so in our natural log, because then we have the natural log of v minus vt minus the natural log of negative dt equals negative b over m times t. Right? Now for step 11, this is a kind of a natural log identity, a natural log rule. Um, what we will do is um, we will, uh, when you have two natural logs subtracted from each other, you can actually combine them into one natural log and divide the two. So I will show you, you will have natural log of v minus vt, and then you can divide by the second term to make it all one natural log. And that will, again, just equal negative v over m times t. Right. Now we will come up top for number 12. I will have to erase this information here. So number 12, what we're going to do is we're going to get rid of that natural log. Okay, So on 12, now remember we have from step 11, natural log of v minus vt over negative vt. So to get rid of that, if you take e to the that exponent natural log, whatever, that cancels the natural log, right? So we will do that. We will have v minus vt over negative vt, but we've got to do it to both sides. So then we have e to the negative v over m times t. Okay, so we took e to the exponent of both sides because that's that's a rule in math, right? You got if you do it to one side, you got to do it to both. All right, so. Now, um, we are going to start simplifying and solving for velocity because it's a velocity function. So we will multiply that negative vt to the other side. v minus vt equals negative vt times e to the negative v over m times t. Now for step 14, again, this is going to be a lot of math all at once. Um, we are going to add that vt over to get vt minus vt e to the negative v over m times t, right? But to simplify that, we'll actually factor out our vt. So we have vt times 1 minus e to the negative v over m times t. Now, what we'll do here uh, we have the time constant tau, and time constant tau is in seconds. Well, b 
is a silly unit. It has kilograms divided by seconds. Mass is in kilograms. So if you take mass divided by the constant B, you actually get the tau uh, value because then you have kilograms uh, divided by kilogram per second, which would give you seconds. You can also say that that would be kilograms times the reciprocal kilogram, seconds per kilogram, and then bingo, you've got seconds, right? So with this in mind, we will complete our step 15. V equals VT times one minus E to the negative T divided by tau. And that is our answer to number one from up top. And the question was, what is the equation that describes the, the graph, right? That describes that function. So our equation below in that red box describes our function over to the right, that asymptotic function. So it's pretty hefty, right? Um, I also wanted to show you guys something real quick. Um, if, we, if we show that we want to find velocity at time tau, and we wanna find the velocity there, uh, we can actually plug in tau for t. So let me show that real quick down here, right? So we have the velocity of velocity function of vt times one minus e to the negative t over tau, right? But we want the velocity at time tau. So that would be vt times one minus e to the negative tau over tau. Well, tau over tau is obviously one. So V of tau equals Vt of one minus e to the negative one. And we already talked about this, right? Oops. One minus e to the negative one is 0 0.632. You can plug it into your calculator if you don't believe me. So V of tau does equal Vt times 0 0.632, which gives you 0 0.632 Vt, just to show that the velocity at time tau really is 0 0.632 Vt. Um, now this really, we don't have a whole lot of physical descriptions of what this means right now for us in this class, but uh, this opens a door to a whole new method to what we can do for viscous fluid resistance, right? Um, we, can, we can find velocity in a viscous fluid if we have tau, if we have Vt, um, we, we, it, it just, it's a new tool in our tool belt, right? That, that allows us to solve in a different way. All right, I'm gonna erase this slide and then we'll continue on. All right, so number two asks, what is tau and what are the units for tau? So we have gone over this already, but I do wanna emphasize this uh, real quick. So we have for number two, right? Tau is a time constant in seconds. And what it does is it describes um, the time it takes to reach 63.2% of our final value. So it's the time it takes to reach 63.2% of our final value. And that is only in our case. Remember, there are other applications of tau, but that's our case uh, right now. And it, again, it's in seconds. Uh, how does tau relate to m and v? So tau actually has a very convenient relationship with m and v. Tau actually equals mass divided by that variable b that kind of describes the 
the, the viscous fluid in a type one uh, drag problem. So number four, right? If B increases, what would tau do? Well, if tau equals M over B, right? And B is increasing. Well, if we think about R equals BV, right? If, a, if the B of a fluid increases, that kind of means that the fluid is more difficult to travel through, right? If that B starts to increase, then you would have a, um, a harder time traveling through it. But for tau, tau is a variable that talks about, or that means um, how quickly you can reach a certain percentage of your uh, terminal velocity. So if the terminal velocity is, sorry, if the viscous fluid is more difficult to travel through, then it will take less time to reach your terminal velocity. So if B increases, tau will decrease. All right, that's our discussion on the time constant. We will continue on to some practice problems, but we will do a practice problem with tau in it. First, a, uh, a type two uh, projectile. So Crazy Joe throws a crazy fish. Crazy Joe throws a 0 0.145 kilogram baseball past a Tampa Ray batter at 42.5 meters per second. Now in our last video uh, on slide 6.3, we actually had a data table that had information on a baseball on the terminal velocity. We actually calculated the drag coefficient. But here, we're going to assume that we haven't actually calculated the drag coefficient. So uh, we have the mass, right? Uh, throws a 0.145 kilogram baseball past a temporary batter at 42.5 meters per second. So we've got mass and we have velocity. What it wants is it wants the resistive force acting on the ball at this speed. And the last slide may have a simpler equation. Um, it doesn't actually, uh, the, that was a typo. Uh, 6.3 has a clue to sub um, to substitute that uh, drag coefficient out. So let's look at that. Zoom in a little bit. R equals one half rho B squared DA. But we can actually uh, use a little trick to get drag coefficient substituted out of this. So if we assume that we're traveling at terminal velocity, we can say that mg equals one half rho vt squared dA. And the drag coefficient would be two mg divided by rho vt squared a. Okay, this is quite important. We can actually use that to substitute into our other equation because we're gonna pretend that we didn't calculate the drag coefficient in the other video and we don't have the profile area at all. So all we have is mass and velocity. We do know the terminal velocity. I will give us that terminal velocity for this baseball is 43 meters per second as we can find on our previous data table. So we will substitute that drag coefficient in here. If we have R equals one half rho uh, V squared A, and then we are going to substitute this two mg divided by rho vt squared a. I'm gonna substitute that in. Now, let's look. The two will cancel with the one half, the rho will cancel, and the a will cancel. So now what we are left with, resistive force equals mg v squared divided by vt squared, which is a great little uh, equation that we can use to solve for uh, to solve for the resistive force. Now, this only works if you have those specific variables, right? If you're missing drag coefficient and profile area, but you have the mass, the velocity, and the terminal velocity, then you can find 
the resistive force here. So we have 0 0.145 times G, which is 9.81. Our velocity was 42.5, and we're going to square that. We divide that all by 43 squared. Now, if you plug that into your calculator, you are going to get approximately 1.39 newtons acting on this baseball. And that doesn't really sound like a lot acting on this baseball, right? But uh, let's look at number two real quick to put this into perspective. Calculate the acceleration of the ball due only to air drag. So what is the acceleration that this air drag is actually putting on the baseball? So let's look at that, right? Uh, if we use the idea that force equals mass times acceleration, but we just want to look at the resistive force. So R is going to equal F. So R equals MA. That means that A, the acceleration would equal R equals R over M, which is 1.39 Newtons divided by 0 0.145 kilograms. That's going to give you a pretty large acceleration. Negative just for direction. You're not going to get a negative in this math, but 9.59 .9 meters per second squared. So that 1.39 Newtons doesn't seem like a lot, but it's also really low mass. So it actually has a sizable um, acceleration. That's actually quite a bit. So it's actually going to work pretty hard on that baseball. Now, number three, would you expect the magnitude of acceleration to increase, decrease, or stay the same as the ball approaches the ray? Well, the thing that is controlling and affecting the acceleration is R equals one half rho V squared dA. Now, the one half obviously doesn't really affect us. The density of the air, that's not changing as we get closer to the batter. The drag coefficient and the profile area don't get don't they don't change as we get closer to the batter, but the velocity does, right? As it gets closer and closer, the velocity decreases. And we have an R is proportional, right? R is proportional to V squared. So as V squared decreases, R is going to greatly decrease because of that squared uh, relationship, right? If, v, if the velocity is cut in half, that means our resistive force is cut in by a fourth. So it's, it's going to drop significantly as it approaches the batter. So we don't have a constant acceleration situation here. It's all gonna be out of whack. And then part four, could you solve part one if you didn't have the baseball's profile area? Absolutely, because we weren't given the, the profile area. So we didn't have this, but by substituting our drag coefficient here, we were able to get rid of the profile area and the problem over here. As long as you have the mass, we all know G, um, velocity and terminal velocity, that's going to work out for you. So that works just fine. Now we've got a towel problem, right? So a small, a small sphere of mass 2.00 grams is released from rest in a large barrel filled with oil where it experiences a resistive force proportional to speed. That is your R equals BV scenario, right? Proportional to speed, not proportional to the square of speed. The sphere reaches a terminal speed of five centimeters per second. So VT equals five centimeters per second, which is 0.05 meters per second. Determine the time constant tau and the time it takes the sphere to reach 90% of its terminal sphere, or of its terminal speed. So we're going to use the tau equation. So again, the tau equation for a refresher. V equals, nope, VT times one minus E to the negative T over tau. 
Now, if it starts asking for mass and the, the B constant, then we can start using those as well, but it's, it's not there, right? So what we need to do is we need to find tau. So this is going to be tricky because our givens, right? We have mass equals two grams, VT equals five centimeters per second. And we also know that VT equals MG divided by B, like we showed earlier, right? So we can actually use this to find uh, B, right? So let's find B using that. B equals MG divided by VT if we reorganize this equation. Right, we have mass, we have gravity, we have VT. That would equal, uh, let's keep this in SI units. So two grams is 0 0.002 kilograms, right? Uh, G is 9.81 meters per second squared. Then VT is 0 0.05 meters per second. You know, that should all work out to give us kilogram per second. I'll show you that in a second. Now, let's find that. So I got 0 0.3924 kilograms per second. Now, if we look here, we're going to get rid of these numbers, and I'll show you how you can get that, right? So the kilograms stay, right? The meters cancel. The per second cancels with one of these. So then you have kilograms per second. And that's how you get your kilogram per second over here. And that, but that's just B, right? We don't want to actually, we don't actually want to box that because that is not the answer we're looking for. We're looking for tau. So we do know from B that tau is mass divided by b and we can go ahead and do that math 0 0.002 kilograms divided by 0 0.3924 kilograms per second there we get 0 0.005097 seconds so this could tell us that we have 5.1 times 10 to the negative one, two, three seconds. And 10 to the negative three seconds is a common unit because that is also 5.1 milliseconds. So that means that it takes 5.1 milliseconds to reach 63.2% of the terminal speed. Now, it's also common in physics to ask how, how long it takes to reach 90% the terminal speed because to reach 100% the terminal speed, as you saw in the uh, graph here, uh, there is a lot of wasted time at the end of this graph just trying to get to the asymptote, right? So it is actually not uncommon for a physics problem to ask you how long does it take to reach 90% of the terminal speed. So let's go ahead and find that because now we have the tau. And tau is going to be the same for the fluid, right? That's, that's a situational fluid term uh, or variable. So we have a lot of variables here to play with. Um, so let's actually now use this V equals VT, 1 minus E to the negative T over tau. And what we want to do is we want to solve for T right? Because we want to find the time. So uh, we know that we want to find 90% of the terminal speed, which means that V equals 0 0.9 VT, right? So we plug that in, 0 0.9 VT equals VT times 1 minus E to the negative T over tau. The VTs can cancel. That can go away. So then we have 0 0.9 equals 1 minus e to the negative t over tau. 
So now we want to isolate our t, right? So let's, we will add e, subtract 0 0.9, so we get e to the negative t over tau equals 1 minus 0 0.9, which equals 0 0.1. So then let's take the natural log. So remember, natural log of e to the x equals x, right? That is just a uh, identity in, in algebra. So we'll do the natural log of both sides. We have negative t over tau equals the natural log of 0 0.1. Now to solve for t, you multiply negative tau times the natural log of 0 0.1. And that is going to give us negative, really small number, negative 5.1 times 10 to the negative 3, all times the natural log of 1, no, sorry, natural log of 0 0.1, negative 2.3, negative 2.3, okay, and that will give you 0 0.01173 seconds, which then we can describe, if we wanna keep this in milliseconds, right? That would be one, two, three, 11.73 milliseconds to reach 90% of the terminal speed. Now, when we're dealing with viscous fluids, it's not uncommon to start dealing with milliseconds because when you are traveling in such a thick viscous fluid, it doesn't take very much time at all to reach that terminal velocity and you're no longer accelerating. Okay, so it, when you get really small numbers for these, don't be too alarmed. Okay. All right, so that is our discussion over uh, the time constant tau and a couple example problems. Uh, after this, we're going to move on to centripetal force to continue through chapter six.